There we go. Yeah, welcome everyone to the Ontology Summit 2020. Uh, this is, today is February 5th, 2020, and we are featuring uh, Chaitan Baru, Senior Science Advisor, as you see there at the National Science Foundation. We'll be speaking today on the NSF Convergence Accelerator Pilot, um, particularly on the Open Knowledge Network. Chaitan, could you please? Yeah, hi. Um, so can you can hear me, right? Yes, everything's good. Can you hear me okay? Yes, yes, go ahead. Okay. Yes, we can uh, hear you okay, Chaitan. Yeah. Great. Um, well, thanks everyone. Uh, thanks uh, Ram for inviting me to this. Um, I heard uh, about somebody being in India. I just got back from India last night. So <laughs> this is the first thing I'm doing after returning. Um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about this uh, program at NSF and uh, one of the tracks within it, which is the Open Knowledge Network. Um, I think this shouldn't take more than, well, 40 minutes at most maybe, so 30 to 40 minutes, and then there's time for Q&A. So let me just uh, launch into this. So what I'm going to talk about is this uh, new and I think very exciting program at NSF. It's, it's a small program, but it's a pilot uh, um, that we are trying out called the Convergence Accelerator. And I'll describe to you what the structure of it is, but there are tracks within that program, and one of the tracks that we are pursuing this year is the Open Knowledge Network. Uh, so let's go forward. So the outline will be to tell you a little bit about the program, to tell you a little bit about tracks within the program, uh, and then talk a little bit on one of those tracks, which we call track A, which is the open knowledge network. And just say a little bit at a very high level about the types of projects. There are too many projects uh, to get into any of the details. Um, plus, of course, all the details are with the, with the projects. Uh, we really can't say too much about them from our side, but uh, anyway, I can give you some sort of a summary of some of the high level issues and ideas that these projects are trying to address. And then we'll talk a little bit about next steps and uh, as usual, the challenges for the future. Um, so all of this arises from a few a couple of years ago, uh, the NSF director, uh, Franz Cordova, uh, did an exercise within NSF to tr basically try and uh, you know, think about strategic directions for NSF for the next 5, 10, 15 year time frame, uh, and then came up with this notion of big ideas. Uh, there are six research themes or ideas, um, which I listed here at the top, and not uh, surprisingly, uh, data, data science, you know, harnessing the data turns, turned out to be one very uh, ubiquitous idea around, but there are also others. Uh, there's one that's called uh, Future of Work at the Human Technology Frontier, which is really about what's happening uh, to the work, uh, the workplace and the employment opportunities in the future, given all the automation going on. And then there's several other science-based uh, ideas, including quantum computing, uh, windows on the universe, navigating the new Arctic and understanding rules of life. We also came up with a few process ideas. That is that we want to do things either a little differently uh, in order to face, you know, tackle these challenges that we are facing, uh, or also identifying some gaps that NSF has traditionally had. And one of those ideas is this notion of convergence that as we go forward, uh, I'll say a little bit more in the next slide, but as we go forward, and try to tackle these really complex issues is no longer a single discipline or even one or two disciplines working together. You really need a merger of many disciplines coming together to tackle these issues. So that's the notion of convergence. And in what I'll be talking uh, today, we'll also hit upon the harnessing data revolution, big idea and the future of work, because that's the first two tracks that we have in the accelerator. So just to say a little bit about uh, convergence research, uh, as NSF defines it. So this paradigm is about, you know, with purpose, bringing together diverse groups of researchers to develop, to you know, explicitly sort of work on developing effective ways of communicating across disciplines, adopting common frameworks, a new scientific language. You know, so everyone has their own vernacular, and this group I don't need to 
uh, tell you, you know, when you're talking about ontologies and so on. So everybody has their own thing, but what happens when you start converging and we really need to talk across all of this? So you, do, you may very well end up creating a new sort of a language out of all of that. But the purpose of doing all of that is to solve these grand challenge issues that require merging of ideas, approaches, technologies, and uh, the, from diverse fields of knowledge, et cetera. And I would argue that you know, data science itself is actually an example of convergence because it did bring together so many different disciplines. And uh, of course, it's still emerging, but that, that's kind of an example. So then if you go based on that and talk about the accelerator concept, um, I think the idea there was that uh, in this journey that we need to make in the sort of multidisciplinary research, uh, there are certain things we can do very quickly. We don't have to wait for the traditional sort of NSF cycles are at least three years, maybe five, sometimes 10 year efforts, uh, centers, et cetera. Uh, but, there could, but we are now at a point where there is so much has already been done that if you, there are certain kinds of uh, problems that can be accelerated. So the reason why we want to do this, of course, is as I said before, we want to leverage science across all fields, um, but then we want to do it in an accelerated uh, framework. Uh, how are we doing it at NSF? It's a new organizational structure within NSF to essentially transition, uh, accelerate the transition of research into practice. So you can, this is, we really call this use inspired research and I like to call it translational research uh, in data science or, or whatever, but it's it's actually in, in a way it's NSF's version of translational research uh, that NIH thinks of in, in other contexts. So the characteristics of projects that are selected here are use inspired. Uh, the outcomes are meant to be things like test beds, tools, uh, again, what I would call platforms very broadly. Um, and not necessarily publications. In fact, if the only things that come out of these are publications, that would be the definition of a failed project. Right? And the projects ha have to think of themselves in the larger national context. So it's not just individual PIs doing something for themselves. Uh, they require partnership with industry. They should have clear goals, milestones, and deliverables because as you will hear, I mean, these are all projects that have to be done within two years. So we need to know what are you gonna deliver in two years. The management is done through this notion of tracks that I'll describe. Uh, so of course there are teams. I mean, eventually the grant goes to a bunch of teams, um, but the set of teams within a track, uh, we, we really want them to think of themselves as a cohort. That's all working together towards something. So there's some cooperation and competition among, um, among them. There's much more directed management from NSF that I'll describe. And the evaluations, as I said, are mission driven, not just about that you publish some interesting, you know, basic research paper. We, we want to know how did you make progress towards the goals. <clears throat> so the pilot, uh, so we are very, I have to say, uh, this started in 2019. Uh, we are very, we think of the 2019 year as a pilot year. Uh, we are, le NSF is learning, this is a, like we like to say within NSF, this is not your father's and mother's NSF, right? This program is very different. And we are, we are learning how to do this ourselves. And of course, the community is learning what the heck is this thing that NSF has come up with. So it's a pilot uh, phase. Um, in, and we have, it works by defining tracks. Um, I think it will be two tracks each year. Certainly, it's two tracks this year. Um, and the two tracks, uh, the themes for those two tracks have come from harnessing data and future of work, as I said. And the open knowledge network is the uh, topic for harnessing data and AI and future work broadly is the topic for uh, the other one. So I, at this point, I'll say, I mean, this is something we are learning and I think so I'm, I'm we have a very small team. So, you know, we are all individually trying to put all this together, but I think, uh, so let me just say a little bit, uh, it's almost in terms of reflection of how would we go about choosing tracks because we are actually in the process of doing this right now for the next year. Uh, so of course they should be on use inspired research, not about basic research things. They, they do require convergence, so that there has to be strong multidisciplinarity in whatever problem you're trying to tackle. Uh, they should be hitting upon national priority ideas. And of course, they should be doable within this format. Uh, the format, uh, as I'll describe, is six months of planning and two years of implementation. The method we have used uh, so far in year one and that we'll also use in year two is um, requesting the community to provide two-page, what we call research concept outlines. 
So uh -huh. tracks will be defined and they'll be told, okay, here are the tracks, uh, send us your con research concepts within those tracks. Um, those will be reviewed and then we <clears throat> invite a subset of those uh, to submit the planning grants. And then only the ones who receive planning grants can apply for the phase two. <clears throat> Um, so as I say, for track for the pilot uh, this year, there are two tracks, A and B. Um, a is about uh, open knowledge network, and we'll just, I'll tell you about the projects. But broadly, we think of the set of projects as sort of verticals and horizontals. And verticals are projects that are coming from specific domain points of view and trying to solve some problem uh, that has been identified in the domain but requires um, knowledge graphs, knowledge network technologies. Horizontals are more projects that are trying to sort of uh, solve a knowledge uh, network problem more broadly, regardless of the domain, even though they also need to have some uh, domain partners. Uh, and track B, about which I'm not gonna say anything in this talk, uh, is about AI and future jobs. And for basically it's sort of, uh, you can think of it as the projects are coming from two different angles. One is the individual. So if I'm, a, if I'm in the workforce uh, and I'm, I'm looking to ups, uh, get retrained and upskilling and reskilling and so on, uh, what are the services available? How do I find out what jobs there are or what jobs will be there you know, by the time I uh, am fully trained, et cetera, et cetera. So it's from, more from the individual point of view and the other set of projects are more from the organizational point of view, if I'm a company with a lot of uh, <clears throat> workers and I want to reskill my workers, uh, wh how do I go about doing it? Uh, how should educational programs uh, maybe be changed to provide micro-credentials, et cetera, et cetera, so people who are already in the workforce can uh, get trained as they're working and so on. So those are the Track B projects, um, but like I say, I won't talk about Track B in this. Uh, and they come from these two uh, big ideas. So talking about uh, the open knowledge network a little bit. Um, so that idea responds to uh, when we, a few years ago, uh, wrote out the strategic documents for harnessing data revolution, uh, we identified a set of things that uh, we thought needed to be done to progress uh, on data science and harnessing data. Uh, one of which was uh, essentially like a semantic infrastructure, knowledge uh, networks, knowledge graphs. Um, and so, you know, that in advanced science, uh, creating an advanced science data infrastructure that is interoperable, uh, has an open architecture, uh, which essentially becomes the semantic infrastructure um, and starting initially with non-proprietary uh, open data so that you don't have to mess around with all the privacy kinds of things and so on. So that was already in the strategic documents from uh, maybe actually three, four years ago. Um, and of course, these kind of technologies uh, are actually being uh, almost uh, are needed. You know, they're being asked for by all the many domains. A lot of this has been going on in biology, but many other domains are coming to this. So, it, it within the NSF context, is something that helps solve all directorates. It's not just a computer science thing. In fact, it is a domain thing. Um, and, and the idea for the OKN uh, itself started quite some time back. Uh, in 20, January of 2015, we had a workshop when we were trying to um, develop the federal R&D strategy for big data. We ran a workshop, invited a bunch of speakers from academia, industry, and government. And one of the talks there, which was given at that time by Andrew Moore, who was Dean of Computer Science at CMU at that time, now he heads up AI for Google, uh, actually sort of mentioned this uh, problem. And, and to this crowd, it's not a new, pro new problem. In a way, it's you know, uh, revisiting a lot of things. So you can think of all of this, uh, what I'm gonna be saying as the spiral model of development. You know, we visit these things, we revisit these things, we come back to it in a new context and so on. But Andrew did talk about uh, how knowledge networks, knowledge graphs are essentially the fundamental platforms for all these big, uh, essentially trillion dollar companies, and that, that those are the platforms that are launching all these new uh, so-called smart applications or AI or whatever. And that got us thinking, saying, okay, we should also be thinking about, and, and he was saying this is only happening in, in industry at this scale, and that they were not seeing enough things going on in academia. 
And that got us thinking a little bit. There were subsequent meetings. Uh, there was a small group we invited, sort of vice president level folks from Amazon, IBM, Microsoft, and Google, uh, some academics, some government folks had a small meeting at the OSTP. This was even under the previous administration. Uh, at each of these meetings, basically, there's a lot of enthusiasm for academia. Uh, one should do this, even though industry is marching ahead, industry tends to do this from a very short term perspective. Uh, they're looking at you know their next quarter products and that kind of thing. And so academia has a role. Uh, we followed that up with a meeting in San Jose because in some way, many ways that's ground zero for these technologies. And we had about 40 different companies, all the usual names you can think of, including you know, Wikipedia, Wikidata, all of those folks. There's lots of interest in the idea. And finally, it culminated with a, a NITRE interagency workshop, uh, which was held at NLM in October 2017. I think Ram uh, was there and a lot of other government folks were there. And there's actually a report for that uh, and some of the URLs uh, you can see. Um, so, you know, one of the things we talked uh, three, four years ago is, you know, that having these sort of so-called natural interfaces to large knowledge structures uh, is a very powerful capability. Of course, industry is already exploiting this, uh, and, and I'm sure you all know this, that in this area now they're just hiring people left and right. Um, however, um, there are big areas of, of data, knowledge, information that industry won't be touching right away, uh, and many of that relate to science uh, data. Um, and it, it clearly is a field that it's not just computer scientists alone, or nowadays you can say data scientists alone who could do it. You really have the knowledge comes from the domain, so you need the domain expertise. So it, it is really very much a convergence uh, kind of activity. Um, the only, uh, the note to mention here, as I said, this is, you can think of this as a spiral approach because it's not as if NSF has not spent a whole lot of money on these topics over the decades, literally, right? Over the last 20, 30 years, we have funded uh, basic research projects in problems of creation of knowledge bases, representation, performance, how to make things go faster. A lot of our own directorates have funded creation of ontologies, in fact, continue to do that. Lots of work on knowledge extraction, NLP, and so on and so forth. So, in a way, we are building on, a, on top of all this, and that actually makes sense because you can't do an accelerator in an area where nothing has been done. Uh, the notion of the actual accelerator is that there's a lot of extent uh, capability, uh, but now you just need a little bit of a push to get to the next level, to sort of jump to the next orbit. Okay, so we are now in phase one of this pro uh, program, and the phase one projects uh, are now listed here. Um, these are roughly divided, the vertical horizontal is, as usual, a fuzzy uh, distinction. Some of these projects could have, could have fallen on either side or both sides. Um, <clears throat> but it's interesting to see the breadth of topics. These projects are all uh, not necessarily led by computer science type PIs. In fact, many of them are led by non-CS, um, but they all have both CS and, non and domain science uh, strong presence, the PI for PI presence. So we have projects in precision medicine, uh, design and manufacturing, urban flooding, uh, space sciences is, is really about sort of solar flares and the disturbances and their impact on uh, power grids. Molecular data is a very broad sort of look at molecular data from a variety of industries, uh, chemi chemical industry as well as other manufacturing. Census is about taking existing census uh, data that are uh, already available and representing them in a graph structure that's much more efficient for fast processing. Court records is taking all of the court records that are currently not available, they're only in PDF form, and actually making a knowledge graph out of all of that. Uh, civil infrastructure is initially focusing on sort of bridge information across the nation. Uh, energy systems is the power grid data. Uh, intelligent textbooks is about, actually it is about creating ontologies for different domains so that you can actually have a platform that allows you to write intelligent textbooks um, for different domains. Public policy, uh, there's one for finance and business data. Uh, mobility is about transportation related data and looking at equity issues uh, within that context. And the ocean resources one is really about the uh, impact of global climate change on fisheries and um, fishing industry. Horizontals are things like um, 
programming environments for knowledge graphs. So if you already have knowledge graphs, what are easy ways to program around them and to query them and, and, and also to do extraction operations. So in a way to generate the workflows uh, that do the work and then make these workflows as shareable objects. Uh, there's one on about credibility. You know, how do you determine how, and what are all the techniques you could use to uh, for credibility? There's one that broadly looks at spatial data. Uh, so regardless of the domain, so how, how should we represent spatial information? Um, one on sort of fed, one is actually biomedical, but it's federated search, searching across um, uh, structured databases, uh, but also it, in, it is actually con connecting medical information with geospatial information. And in fact, uh, come to think of it, coronavirus is interesting because all of these uh, outbreaks uh, have uh, spatial uh, con uh, components. So their, their use case is something called valley fever that used to happen only in Arizona. Now it's coming into Southern California because of climate change problems and, and so on. Uh, the one on web data extraction and integration. So how, if we have structured scientific databases on one side, but you have all this unstructured information on the web and you want to connect those. Uh, internet uh, is about capturing the internet structure uh, and extracting semantic information out of that so that maybe you can understand uh, some bad things that might be happening uh, with a higher level understanding of, of all of that and special decision support systems. So that's uh, no, really dump for you on all the kinds of projects. Uh, as I said before, uh, even though these are all individual projects, we require them to look for track integration. In fact, uh, a requirement as they go into phase two is that they all, each project needs to have an explicit plan about how they will work as a group with everyone else. They are required to collaborate with industry. Um, and we also encourage them to look at what else is going on in the community and leverage as much as possible. Once again, this is not about inventing things from zero. There's a ton of, I mean, going back to this idea of you know, choosing tracks is, is a skill that we still have to develop at NSF fully. But you know, tracks are, should be selected so that there's already some stuff going on. That means projects have to leverage the stuff that's going on. And we, we look for that. And we also help the projects uh, you know, lead them to places where they, they may be able to leverage other things. So I looked across all the projects. I mean, without going into uh, details of uh, project level information, some of the themes are many of the projects are looking at heterogeneous uh, data. And you can imagine from the list I gave you before you know, what that could be. Uh, for example, one uh, the biomedical folks um, think of the data in the whole discipline, and they, they're trying to do precision medicine, and they think of the data as their biomedical facts. Um, so these are things that might be published in papers uh, and have you know, established certain relationships. This causes that, etc. So those are the facts. Uh, of course, in biomedicine, there's tons of uh, big, well-established databases. So there are catalogs of actual data. And now there's also what they call raw data, which is, you know, stuff that's coming from wearables and all of that. So, we, you know, lots of medical information that's now being generated uh, out there in the wild. So their problem is how do we integrate all of this? And, and they want to make uh, more of a graph uh, form out of that. Another one is looking at internet, uh, both the configuration data, so domain name systems and traffic data, BGP routing protocols, all sorts of things. And these are all people who are expert at internet analysis. In fact, this group is actually international, though we only fund the US part. Um, and they all, they want to, and everybody's been, there are little groups all over uh, US and, and the world looking at bits and pieces of this and they want to say, can we get to the next level? Can we integrate? and then look at uh, patterns, et cetera, at a, at a higher uh, conceptual level of what's going on in the internet. Other, another theme here is uh, we actually, we do tell these projects that we expect whatever they build to be an open system. So whatever they have built, others should be able to later on come and add to it, contribute, et cetera. Uh, so we don't want you know, static, brittle structures. So accommodating dynamic information uh, is important and of course a lot of these uh, projects uh, that's essential to what they're doing so how do you put newly acquired data and information in, into the network um, again many projects have argued that 
the graph model is uh, is good for that because you know it's basically nodes and edges and you can just keep adding things and, and so on um, <clears throat> so you need the capability to add new vertices edges as, as new knowledge is added uh, schemas might change etc you can imagine that there are versioning issues uh, and all of that uh, in these um, <clears throat> Other uh, types of issues, supporting access, uh, this is an interesting one, supporting access by and contributions to the knowledge graph by heterogeneous community of users. So remember that these are all, almost uh, many of them at least, are multidisciplinary groups putting things together. So if you talk about urban flooding, in an urban area there are many different uh, uh, stakeholders who come together who hold very different kinds of data everything from remote sensing to model outputs to iot kinds of data uh, and they're all coming from different agencies different perspectives and so due to the multidisciplinary multi-stakeholder concept uh, you have people who may be experts in one aspect of it but they are not really experts in the other but they all want to contribute into this uh, shared infrastructure so how do you make sure that uh, everyone can contribute um, and that all of that information, come, which may be coming at different levels of sophistication, actually gets added into the knowledge network. And the, conversely, there are multiple users of this. It's not as if this knowledge graph is just being used by advanced research in the, uh, researchers in a particular area. In fact, we want the users to be uh, across the board. So how do you also provide uh, the information back to different levels of users? Uh, there's also this notion of, you know, as you're extracting knowledge and information from various sources, uh, there are sort of broadly two approaches uh, across this set of projects. One is machine learning types of approaches and the other is crowdsourcing type of approaches. So uh, how do we, how do projects combine those things? So the intelligent textbooks, for example, their whole idea is that these textbooks are powered by knowledge graphs. Uh, currently, this is done in a very slow way with experts uh, doing detailed ontologies, but they would like to, exp how do you scale this up? Right now, it, uh, you know, their estimation, it takes multiple years and something like a couple of million dollars to do an intro text, one intro, one part of an intro textbook for biology, which is clearly not scalable and, you know, just can't be done for everything else. So how do you automate that and how do you make it uh, more scalable? Um, I mentioned your track B. So actually, I, I just want to say that there are also projects in track B that are very much looking at ontologies and knowledge uh, graph kinds of things, because there are projects that are looking at jobs, postings out there, uh, or course listings out there, and trying to uh, extract from them uh, what are the requirements in terms of skill sets, et cetera, for those jobs and, and those courses. And if some of you may be familiar, there's already something called Skills ML, uh, which is already an ontology for skills, both hard skills and soft skills. So there are projects even in Track B doing that, and we of course uh, ask these projects to talk to each other between A and B. So, all right. So now I'm to the talking more about the program. Uh, next steps. Um, so right now we're in the phase one, the planning phase, which goes from September to May of this year. Um, the planning phase requires all the projects to participate in monthly meetings uh, and also to take the what we call the CA curriculum, Convergence Accelerator. The curriculum includes uh, modules on design thinking and user-centered design. Because remember, this is user-inspired research, so these PIs should be thinking about, oh, I have a user, and you know, am I doing things that makes this user happy, uh, or what the user wants. They also get modules in team science because these are teams coming together and they have to learn how to operate in multidisciplinary groups. Uh, sometimes, and already some teams have done this, teams may have to uh, jettison. I mean, you know, they may not need all the people they thought they needed, so they will get rid of some folks. So already we have received lots of irate phone calls at NSF from co-PIs who might have been told, okay, we don't need you in phase two. <laughs> and they're very upset. Um, <clears throat> And also it includes uh, you know, introducing these teams to domain uh, talks or experts from industry and other places who can talk about knowledge graphs or uh, future of work type issues. Each team works with a coach and a coach is somebody who uh, has experience in startup kinds of things and the coach helps them think through how to do all of this user-centered and uh, user-inspired research. 
um, team refinement. I wonder what I meant there. Um, anyway, so uh, the um, oh, the team refinement is I think what I meant there is they help them sort of figure out what team do you really need, and you know if you're missing some people, can you add them? And some teams are doing this, or you know if you don't really need some parts of the thing, can you uh, jettison those and so on? Uh, every team is required to conduct a set of user interviews. In fact, they must conduct at least 12 user interviews across a broad range of users for the kinds of things that they're doing. And results from that have to be included in their proposal for phase two. And some teams have done 30, 40 interviews. Um, and, and so I have to say that as for the teams in the beginning were not quite sure what they got into, but now they really seem to be enjoying uh, this process. So phase, which includes all of this. So in phase one, we have monthly me monthly meetings, uh, webinar one month and a face-to-face -face meeting the next month. There are 43 teams, 21 in track A and 22 in track B. We require at least three people per team to turn up. Uh, the kickoff was in October in DC. Uh, then the other next face-to-face -face was in San Francisco uh, because we invited a lot of industry folks there. Uh, in the DC meeting, we invite a lot of government folks. In both the meetings, one of the there are multiple sessions. That's where they sit and listen to all these uh, design thinking uh, classes, team science. But one of the things we also do is like office hours. We, so all the people who turn up, whether from government agencies in DC or industry folks in San Francisco, we put them at different tables, and then teams can go to them as if it's office hours and have discussions. Uh, and these, those have proven to be very fruitful. Uh, in, in San Francisco, we had Google, Microsoft, Amazon, I think Elsevier, and, and some others, all on the knowledge graph side. Um, and and I, I actually think these new, uh, new collaborations have emerged from that. The companies found these things quite interesting. So, so that's how that works. Um, our next meeting is coming up uh, February 18th. Uh, through 21st, I think we'll be again in San Francisco. This time we'll try to in, in, uh, invite more of the foundations and other people who are potential co-funder, other co-funders um, for face-to-face -face, uh, meetings. In, in addition to all this in the planning phase, the projects are also expected to organize community workshops because remember we, both in terms of uh, reaching out to a community of potential users for the things that they're developing, who are the people who use it, but also in terms of connecting to others who may already be doing things so they can understand you know, what they can leverage and so on. Uh, let's see. That'll take us into phase two. Um, so that's the implementation phase. It will start in June of this year and go for two years, but in a one plus one model, uh, they'll be reviewed at the end of the first year and the second year funding depends on their success in the first year. Uh, they have to submit a proposal uh, by April or so. Uh, in addition to the proposal, they are required to make about a 10 minute uh, pitch to a room full of potential funders and that's NSF, but we are also trying to invite other foundations, venture capital, other agencies and so on. Um, and those others uh, will also be able to submit what we call expressions of interest. They can say, oh, that project sounds interesting to me or that piece of that project uh, sounds cool and I would be willing to fund that. And we put all of this into the input, uh, make the decisions. So even if we didn't fund some project, uh, one of the other funder co-funders could say, well, I'm going to put money and I, I want these guys to get into phase two. So that could happen. From NSF point of view, we have money for about five awards per track nominally uh, with $5 million each. Uh, for each project, so uh, um, so ten at five, so fifty million, uh, so and up to three million in the first year, um, and as I said, it's all based on uh, their performance in the first year will determine whether they get funded for the second year. So I think that's it. Uh, I think I sort of gave you a dump of what the OKN looks like and what the program is, and I'll just say a little bit about. Uh, the next steps that we are thinking. Uh, the OKN projects themselves, uh, we are strongly encouraging them to <coughs> link with, uh, become aware of and link with other relevant efforts. Um, we are also trying to help them think through 
Uh, so remember that they get funded for two years, they have to deliver something, then what happens to sustainability after that? So there are many programs coming along. NSF has just announced AI institutes, which if they start this year will go for five years. So if a knowledge graph, knowledge network project uh, affiliates or associates itself with an AI institute, that would give them some more longevity. Uh, but there are big efforts. So I have a meeting coming up with NIH. Um, I, uh, and, and of course, DOE uh, is part of the big data interagency and, and AI group. But, but NIH has a big data science strategy. DO, DOE, of course, has the AI technology office. Uh, NIST Ram is here. And there are others at NIST who are doing a lot of stuff. Uh, related to all of this and AI. So, you know, there may be other ways. So this is where we are trying to help them think about what the future might uh, look like. Um, like I mentioned, as we are doing all of that, we are also thinking about the new tracks for the next year. Um, I should have said 2020. It's 2020 and 2021. We are also thinking about what, how to j get the community to start thinking for 2021 year. But for 2020, uh, to start thinking for 2020, we, we funded them to run a bunch of workshops. Um, and a variety of workshops were run on different topics, as I mentioned here. But uh, some of the ones that may be interesting to this group are AI and disasters, where, which, um, which of course is related a lot to you know, knowledge networks and so on, data privacy and data governance and so on. So uh, based on all of that, and we also have a thought that maybe we should also look at uh, within the current tracks A and B, um, if there are specific things that we felt like we are miss missing something or there's a gap, maybe we could also do some gap filling. Uh, so this is all actively being uh, thought about right now. Um, and, and the same thing about you know what what should be the strategic direction direction for the CA program. Uh, I find it uh, tremendously exciting to be here to be part of this, but uh, uh, but you know. Anything you do, there are skeptics, right? <laughs> so there are others wondering, oh, what's all this about? So we'll see. So we, we have to think about what the future strategy uh, ought to be for a program like this. Uh, I think that's my last slide. So I'm open to questions now. Uh, nobody has raised their hand, but uh, we've gotten some questions on the chat. Ravi has a um, couple of questions. Ravi, I can't unmute you. Now, I, I have unmuted now, I'm sorry. Chaitanya, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, my question number one is, how do you, uh, and it's a question I'm sure many have, how do you go from OKN to KG knowledge graphs? What is similar concept in both these terms? And uh, how did you choose heterogeneous communities on a common definition of knowledge graph? Right. You um, said that in your slides. Yeah. So it's a good question because when we were looking at these uh, projects, um, they do come from many different domains. So as you can imagine, not uh, there is a highly developed, I would say there's a highly developed community of in the computer science area that deals with ontologies and graphs and so on uh, that has been polishing this for a long time. But there are a lot of people out in the domain with sitting with real data who, who have not been part of that community. So uh, they, a lot of projects, proposals did not come in with very well-defined views of what, what they want to do. Is it you know, our ontologies or this, that, and the other? They just said, hey, we have this problem. And, and of course, they, they, were able to, they had enough of uh, a team that they could articulate why they thought uh, Broadly, a knowledge network, but a knowledge uh, graph structure is needed. But that's a good question because there was some issue of what is a knowledge network. So I think we ended up saying, you know, is not is knowledge network just a network of experts talking to each other? Yes, it could be that. 
is knowledge network just uh, a bunch of databases that are actually that, that is knowledge network a knowledge graph okay that actually you're extracting entities uh, defining relationships and creating that structure is that what you're funding and the answer is yes and the third one was the knowledge network technology because actually we did get some projects uh, that came in saying we are going to build a data lake and do this or we're going to build a scalable cloud infrastructure and, and the answer is yes, right? So <laughs> knowledge network is all of these things. And you could think of knowledge graph as that way. Um, also, there was some discussion about, you know, wow, should we have called this knowledge graph? And then we realized, no, because knowledge graph is only something that computer scientists understand. The moment you say something like knowledge graph, it actually is a very technical term that you, puts off a lot of domain people because they don't, uh, they don't understand what the heck you're saying. So knowledge network sounds sufficiently fuzzy and sometimes there are value, there's a big value to having fuzzy terms like convergence accelerator, nobody understands what the hell that is. But then that means you get the opportunity to tell people what it is. Uh, and the knowledge network was like that. Um, there was also a question, in fact, we have at least one uh, in our cohort of projects that said, oh, we must all sign up to this one way of doing things. Uh, oh, you all, you all have, you know, you're all grown up folks. You, you can see how successful or unsuccessful something like that is going to be. Um, so we said, okay, this, some of this has to be emergent and that's actually going to be the challenge of phase two. And that's why in phase two, each project is explicitly required to set aside a piece of the budget to come up with exactly what you said. Because uh, we did have, uh, can I say this? I, I guess I can. We did have certain projects, we did have uh, project ideas that came in that said, okay, we're gonna organize the whole world. You know, we're gonna create huge standards committees and this and that, and, and we're gonna just, and we said, no, that's, it's too, uh, for this program, that's not what we're looking for and it's too early in this program we are going to let it be a little bit emergent but not completely right i mean it, it's not as if they should ab initio create something they should be aware of what else is going on uh, in fact rdf uh, many of these people are using rdf we had guha guha is one uh, is for some people who might know uh, ramnath and guha is at google he was at all of our okay and meetings that i talked about he's actually a co-pi on one of these projects and he's leading something at Google called datacommons.org, which is completely using BigQuery and uh, scalable in the cloud and uh, using RDF uh, and schema.org extensions. Okay, that, it's a complete solution. And in fact, that was the thing, said, here, I've done it, take it. NSF should, NSF should ask everyone to do this. So no, <laughs> that's one way and you should definitely be part of the community. And many of our projects, by the way, are talking to him and others at Google. Uh, but that part of it, I think, needs to be a little bit uh, emergent. So we'll have to see what uh, comes out of that. Uh, just a last question from me was uh, metrics. How do you set up metrics for such a mammoth uh, wide ranging set of subjects, domains, technologies and directions for future? How do you measure yourself? Uh, for let's say first year, second year, third year of this program? Yep, that's a great question. And actually, if any of you have good ideas, let us know. Because we are trying to figure out. <laughs> yes. yeah, of course, yes. it's because difficult. We're trying to figure out what should be the metric. Um, because fundamentally, in the old days, I would say NSF had no metrics, right? You just fund you and you're gone. Uh -huh. Then NSF introduced this notion of uh, you have to write a section that talks about results of prior work. Well, that's a metric because I can say, okay, I gave you money in the past. What did you do with it? Okay. Uh, now we have this program um, and certainly we have to evaluate them in phase one. I mean, they're gonna, all going to write a proposal and we have to, uh, if, I mean, there are certain things we said, like, you know, mechanic, there are some, like we said, you have to have 12 interviews. <clears throat> okay, we can see, did you have your 12 interviews and what did you glean from it? So you can tell something about how well, how good of a job did these people do? And, and I have to say, we can already, you know, one can already see certain projects are humming along and seem to be doing the right, you know, 
seems like they're doing things the way you might think and others are still wondering what did we get into and so on. Um, but then comes phase two, right? What is the metric of phase two? Um, and I have to say that, no, we're trying to figure this out. It's, this is not a program where we said, okay, we know exactly what the endpoint is going to be. And I'm not talking only about track A. Same thing goes for track B. In fact, sometimes we think track A is easier because we're talking about a knowledge network. And you could say certain things about, you know, how much data did you ingest or how many kinds of user queries did you support or some things like this. Um, or what are the APIs that you develop? How easy is it to put new information into your graph? But the other tracks, not only this year, but coming in the future years, it's going to be, you know, one has to think uh, about Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Chetan. Some of the questions are answered, okay. some are Mark, still open. Thanks. Mark has his hand up now. Hey, greetings. and. Uh, Thanks so much for coming to speak with Ontolog, and I got to meet with you at NIDR D a couple of years ago. It was really uh, great to, you know, convene in person at the NSF venue. I really miss that scenario. So mm -hmm. that's an aside. But I wanted to ask you, you, I might have dropped the thread in your deck. So if this is redundant, I apologize. But I'm trying to understand how you are interleaving this uh, human-computer interaction facet of the work into the research because uh, in, in the NIST work on big data standards, we had a lot of trouble coming to terms with uh, separate assessments for modeling different kinds of users. And it gets to be very domain specific and, and difficult. So just wonder if what thoughts have been given to that. Right, um, I'm not sure if I, uh, well, so I don't know if you were asking about the user-centered design part of it, but anyway, let me, I would say one, um, this is one of the reasons we wanted these folks to uh, be exposed to this notion of uh, user-centered design and how you kind of design around the fact that there are some end users who have to be using this. I, I have to say that in the set of projects that we, we got, uh, just like we got pushback on all aspects of this program, <laughs> we got some pushback on that because there are actually people that we have funded who are leaders in that field. So they came right. and said, why are you teaching me this? I actually teach this to my students. Uh, but at the same time, there are a lot of the projects that had no clue what user-centered design was and so on. Uh, bottom line of it, whether they liked it or not or got anything, what we found is it actually put them in a, uh, in a bit of an uncomfortable position. These are traditional PIs who've never had to think about users. And that alone uh, actually made them, you know, got their juices flowing. So that was a good part. Now to your question of, yes, so I think different domains are going to have very different kind of users. Um, I mentioned urban flooding. They are working with state and local government, very, very local sort of you know, city level, county level folks. Um, there is precision medicine, that's their real end user is the patient. Uh, so I think, I think that will also be very, that goes back to this notion of metrics. I don't think there's one metric that's going to work even within an OKN context. I think we'll just have to see uh, project by project uh, what they have done. Understood. Thank you. Say, Mike Bennett has some questions. Hi, Ken. Sorry, I didn't put my hand up. I was just uh, uh, spooling out a couple of thoughts onto the chat. Um, <clears throat> really, two related questions. Um, and as a non US citizen, I should add. Um, the first thing is uh, you mentioned finance, uh, string number A7153 whatever the word for it is, um, is the potential for developing a, an ontology for finance? And I said here reference ontology, which brings me to my second point. But I guess what I'm asking there first is, you know, there's a lot of interest in, you know, the standards world, in ISO TC68 and FIC and others, uh, in uh, having a, uh, a kind of ontology for the meanings of things, not necessarily a knowledge graph and that's the second question um yeah there are some some people when you say ontology instinctively and only assume you mean something in our 
something where there is uh, computational data types, something which works perfectly with the semantic web, where it's all about that web of data. Other people, when you say ontology, talk about truth makers and uh, basically the ontological representation of, of real things or concepts of real things. And there's, there's different stuff within that big box of uh, you know, realist versus conceptualist. But those kinds of ontologies are often better used for reference, for artificial intelligence, for business understanding of things like, you know, is a smart contract a contract and things like that. Now, not everybody gets that those are two different kinds of ontologies. So my second question is whether the folks you're working with have uh, actually made any commitments in that distinction or are thinking particularly one thing or the other. And that, of course, colours the answer to my first question about developing kinds of finance ontology, because the object management group's already developed a computational uh, semantic web style of ontology called yeah. FIBO for finance but that's not necessarily that's not what i'm talking about and asking about which is what the standards bunch are now looking at which is actual reference ontology so long question hope it made sense <laughs> no it did i mean so basically the question says you know there's lots of complexity and the yep. the uh, the uh, the scope is pretty wide and so these projects uh, at one level have to figure out uh, what can they get done in two years? So, for example, the finance, they, they actually call themselves the business open knowledge network, I think, even though we call oh. it as finance. So, it's, it's actually, uh, and they have people like the U.S. Patent Office, uh, uh, federal. Uh, mm. so, so, when you said finance and commerce or finance and so it's, it's Yeah, it's about more about business data, but, but, but your point is, Brilliant. yeah, but, but your point is well taken in that, in that uh, and actually the, the group that's doing it is, is pretty knowledgeable in all of this. Good. Yeah, because in fact, so, sorry to cut in, but um, I've been working, you know, I worked on the original conceptual um, pre forerunner to that FIBO thing, but subsequent to that, I've, I've been figuring that it's possible to come up with a good single coherent reference ontology across business and finance and insurance and commerce and all that kind of non physics, non biology kind of stuff all the potentials there there's a lot of research like rea and other things that feed into that um i i just haven't seen an, a good venue to yeah to make it happen i'm wondering if this is it well i don't know <laughs> because these are remember two-year efforts but uh, at the last face-to-face -face meeting i got a lot of questions from the team saying uh you know basically uh, in a way, asking your kind of question, saying, what, what should we do? You know, what, what is, how do we get successful? Oh. And my answer to all of these teams is, your best friend is your use case. What, what is the use case? Do you actually have a user for, for something that you want to do? Uh, and actually, I think that helped them think that way. So I think whenever this comes up, I, are you ask, like you asked, you know, are you trying to solve a business question? Or are you just trying to take all the data that you have and put it into this kind of ontology? Uh, if so, why? Uh, whatever it is that you want to do, you want to be able to show that there is a user who wants this. Right. You've got to be a bit careful with use case. It can, you're absolutely right. Everything has to have a business reason to exist and be funded. But uh, use cases can end up being very narrow and end up driving what are essentially applications. Well, Yes, so so that, that's wrong and that's where the trick. reference language. Hmm. Correct, correct, and that's where the trick is going to be, and and that's where hopefully they're meeting with the coaches, they're talking with the user-centered design folks, and you know they're all pretty senior researchers themselves. Will uh, allow them to sort of come up with problems that look um, that, that at least the solutions behind this, I mean, you know, what they're providing as an answer to a specific question may look like a very simple thing. But then they say, but look, here's all the things we had to do to get there. And we have actually enabled all this data or we have created this massive knowledge graph or, or whatever. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think they still need to be driven by what's that end goal. <clears throat> Are there some clear, clear yeah. end goals that you can show in two years? Uh, and then what is the path? And like exactly like you said, if, if somebody did some very simple application development in two years and $5 million, that's not going to be success. That's right. You need to elevate it beyond an yeah. application somewhere 
there's a need for yeah. a common language. The other way, yeah. the other thing I should also say, which is also a difficulty for us right now, we're trying to uh, figure out in the NSF context in the US at least, uh, most of our researchers are used to uh, spending a maximum of two months uh, because that's actually a restriction that NSF puts that you can't put more than two months of your salary on a project. In these projects, we want people to put six months. Okay, right. so we want, in fact, we are asking department chairs and deans to provide what is here is called course release, that people can buy out their courses because we need substantial amounts of time of the principal people in the project. Now, we, we've received projects where people said, oh, I'm gonna spend 5% of my time and I'm gonna have 10 grad students doing something and that's the wrong answer. Right? We, we, we need substantial teams working together and that's where the startup mentality comes up uh, and doing it for two years. And you got, you have, if you have a good team and good set of goals, you gotta be able to achieve something in, in two years for that amount of effort. Mm. Okay, great. Um, David and Todd are both asking questions. Todd has his hand up. How do I put my, how do I put my hand up? Uh, David, yes, so you had a question. Um, is there any consideration for my favorite windmill, unnatural language? What is that? It's the opposite side of natural language. Hmm. Now you have to give me an example. Software. Uh, yeah, keep Software going. is not written for human consumption. It does not obey the rules of human language. Right, right. Okay. So you're talking about... That's why I will take your answer as no, there's no... No. Yes. <laughs> no. Thank you. That's all I needed. Okay. <laughs> Over to you, Todd. Okie doke. Um, I have just a short question. Is the NSF um, coordinating or working with the, any organizations from the EU? They have question. Been... And the answer is yes. I've just been exchanging this email this morning with a bunch of EU folks. The way that's happening, at least, uh, and if any of you know of other things, do let us know. But the way, the way it's happening right now is the uh, E, uh, by the way, uh, I don't know if anyone here knows the name uh, Barrent Mons. So Barrent was the, uh, Barrent is very, very familiar with the OKN activities. We've been talking quite a lot with him, but he was the first executive director of something called the European Open Science Cloud. Mm -hmm. um, but he's also the big uh, proponent for something called FAIR, which is findable, accessible, interoperable, reusable data. And that has become a big sort of uh, movement uh, Baron was here about two weeks ago, um, and looks like Europe is about to put a, EU is about to put a whole lot of money into the fair activity, uh, and he was very encouraged that we have started this OKN activity. Uh, so what we are dis and, and NSF, there are other parts of NSF that are beginning to look at this whole fair thing, and I know NIH is into it, and and, and so is DOE. Actually, the Big Data Interagency Working Group is going to run a workshop later this year. Uh, sponsored by DOE and NSF and others uh, on the FAIR uh, idea. So uh, the discussion there is, you know, you create all these ontologies from some kinds of data. Uh, well, that has to be rooted back to the data and the way you can root and FAIR is the, this FAIR activity, which wants to have all sorts of unique identifiers for all sorts of things, uh, would be the one that allows that connection to happen. So, the answer is yes, we are talking to uh, them. And in fact, what we have just discussed is that we might be able to fund activities on both sides. NSF can fund our folks, EU can fund their folks to facilitate uh, regular interaction between the two on between OK and on our side and all the fair stuff on their side. Are, uh, I, I don't know about the legality of, of NSF. Are you allowed to coordinate in some coherent fashion with the EU? specifically EU government organizations or agencies so that you're sort of not duplicating work or could work off of the results of each other? Oh, sure. I mean, well, you know, if, if the science is open, we're all for open science of so open results. We can, uh, we can leverage obviously. NSF does do things like joint programs. So we have uh, proposals that are jointly funded with, I can think of examples with Israel, with Finland, with Japan and so on. 
But the way it works is we fund our side, they fund their side. Right. But the program is a joint program. So absolutely. Yeah. Oh, cool. Uh, one last request, if you could. Could you repeat what that acronym FAIR stood, stands for? Yes, FAIR. Um, I think nowadays, if you just Google FAIR, it must be the top hit <laughs> because there's a lot of discussion on it. But FAIR stands for Findable, Accessible, Interoperable, Reusable Data. So FAIR data. Got it. Thank you. Yeah. See who's next, Gary. Oh, sure. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So I had a simple question that sort of get at the openness uh, of this, and uh, I wondered at what point uh, what is in the knowledge networks will become accessible to other researchers in the public, and uh, a more restrictive question is: Will all phase one networks be accessible? Ah, good question, because I actually, you know, I didn't touch on it, but I sort of mentioned somewhere along the way that when we first started open, so now what we tell teams is open here means open system. Okay, so you should, it should be, you should have APIs or whatever it is that allows people to access and contribute to the structures that you have created. Uh, in the beginning, our idea of open was that literally it was all open data, just to keep it simple. Uh, but there are actually very quickly you come to a place where uh, there are data, you know, the precision medicine folks, for example, are actually uh, harvesting electronic health records and so on. So, but the knowledge graph, uh, information in the knowledge graph has no privacy information and that's open. So what we're gonna be asking these teams is the data products that they create uh, out of whatever processing they do, those should be open, actually literally openly accessible but certainly also there needs to be, it should, needs to be an open system. Um, we are, but having said that, uh, not just the precision medicine, even the internet group, uh, most of the data that internet guys deal with is actually proprietary data. Uh, the data itself cannot be exposed, but a lot of the derived information from that can be exposed. I mean, it's basically the knowledge graph level can be exposed. So that's the way it's going to be. Uh, we expect. And, and even in the original OKN discussions, there was already, you know, right from the beginning, there was a discussion that, um, and I remember the IBM people brought it up because that's what they faced when they were doing Watson initially. There's a lot of data that IBM was acquiring uh, had all sorts of different license requirements and they had to maintain complete provenance of where the data was being used because the people who provided them data said, hey, here's how you're going to, you know, give me pay me back or whatever, give me credit. And in the scientific area, credit is gonna be extremely essential. So we have to keep track. So, so the data may not uh, move, but at least we have to keep prominence that, well, we got this from that source and so on. So yeah, all of those complications are gonna be there. Thank you. Great, um, we're kind of running out of time, but uh, we have uh, Janet Wong. Uh, maybe a quick question. I, I don't, hi, this is Jeanette. I, I actually think that I, I, I think the, it, my question has been answered through the previous, um, what I just heard right now. Okay, great. The and, uh, results, yeah, of the projects. Janet Singer? Hi, yeah, thanks. Um, very rich collection of facets for us to um, yeah. ponder as we go ahead. Um, and so really appreciate your presentation. Um, I would like if you could uh, repeat the, um, the three senses that you gave of knowledge networks. So uh, you distinguish knowledge networks from knowledge graphs and then knowledge networks. The first one was connected experts. Yeah. And what were the other two? Oh, so the first one was just a, a collection of experts. Mm -hmm. uh, the second one essentially is a collection of data. <laughs> so that's the actual knowledge graphs uh, with data in them, entities, relationships, and so on. And the third one was the technological infrastructure. Um, that it's this, uh, for example, the um, uh, datacommons.org that Google is developing, 
they have a software stack that completely implements whatever system they have. And that software stack is now available in Apache. Anyone can deploy it on any cloud, doesn't have to be Google Cloud. Uh, so the third part is the technological infrastructure that enables the knowledge graphs. Great. Very good. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Thank, thank you, Chaitan, and thanks to all of our yeah. participants. Um,